We've all been there. We've all had a time in our life where we thought, that's it. I, I blew it. I've really messed this up. I, I've messed up royally. Uh, one time for me, as I was 16 at Christmas time, I, I was given my first car as a gift, a little Ford, uh, 1990 Ford, uh, red Ford uh, uh, Fiesta, little hatchback little guy. I fit in there barely. And so it was my first car. And about six months later, I rear-ended Willard Hahn. Willard was the biggest, he was a senior. I was like a sophomore, junior, somewhere in there. Willard was like the biggest redneck in school. I think that's words okay that he still use. Uh, he was the biggest redneck in school. And uh, within minutes, uh, everyone else was pulled over yelling, kick his butt, um, <clears throat> Willard. And I was like, oh gosh. Um, thankfully, uh, my dad didn't kill me. My dad was full of grace and did not kill me. Then I wrecked my second car, actually totaled my second car, and I fully expected, okay, this is it. Dad is going to kill me. And uh, sure enough, dad was gracious, and he did not, did not uh, punish me that, that much. And then I wrecked the third car. I, I have a track record, guys. And uh, thankfully, my dad was full of grace. And thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy on your son. Uh, but then I stopped wrecking cars, and so everything's fine now. It's all right. But, but what about you? I mean, every... Every person has a story where you felt like, you've ever been in that moment where you felt like, I've really messed this one up. I've really, I mean, royally messed up. As sinners, we tend to mess up things. Uh, with, we have all kinds of stories in this room, things of what we did or words that we spoke or said that caused pain in life. Uh, some, even today, are still living in the consequences of those things that you did. You're living in the consequences, the fruit of, of your sin. Maybe it was a decision you made or a sin committed across the room, stories of heartache, lies told in marriages, addiction in your life, selfish desires, sin in the choices you made or even the words that you spoke, ignoring rules that maybe you, your parents set up for you, but you said, I don't want to obey, making morally compromising decisions at work or somewhere else. See, when we sin, we begin to believe as believers, when we sin as believers, we begin to believe maybe the lies that Satan lobs at us, throws at us. Lies like if people knew the real you, if people knew what you have done or how you have royally screwed this up or screwed that up, if they were to find out, then, then they would just see you for who you really are, and they would abandon you. Maybe some of you sit here today, and you, even today, some in, in their mind think, man, I don't know that God will ever love me because of this. Or you wonder, does God really love me or not? Or has God forsaken me, or has God abandoned me? Surely, Jacob was feeling the same thing. If we remind ourselves where we found him, he is on the run after having lied to his father, cheated his brother, blasphemed God, and now at the request of his mother, he has been pushed away from the family, on the run from his brother who is after him, who wants to kill him. So Jacob's like running for his life. He's fleeing, and for what? For wanting the blessing of God, but getting it the wrong way. He's got the blessing, and he was willing to do whatever it meant. If that meant blaspheming God, then he would do so. And he had royally messed up. So we fully expect to find Jacob as an enemy of God. We fully expect expect to find Jacob with the Lord after him, the Lord trying to judge him and hurt him. If there was anyone worth forsaking, it was Jacob. But that's not what we find in Genesis 28. We find something wholly different. God meets Jacob right where he is, on the run, guilty of lying and cheating his father and brother and deserving of punishment. But the blessing that Isaac gave him is now genuine and true. Isaac came back around, chapter 28, 1 through 5, and blessed Jacob and assured him of the blessing and sent him away with it. And now Jacob here finds himself on the run, but he meets God who is full of grace. God is a God who's fully of grace full of grace and mercy for his people. And there's one thing that God blesses Jacob with that is different than the blessings that he gave 
Abraham or Isaac. God adds something special to this blessing, and it's found in verse 15. I want you to to read it with me because it's going to serve as our main idea today. And here it is. He says this, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Here's the main idea. The Lord is present, is with his people wherever they go. Sorry, the Lord is with his people wherever they go. The Lord is with his people wherever they go. I don't know where you're at today or what you're dealing with or how you might feel or for what reason you might feel forsaken or abandoned. But if you belong to Christ, I want you to know that the Lord is with you wherever you go with whatever you face and whatever trial that you're in. And there are three things I want us to see today from this text. The first thing is this. With the Lord, there is unrivaled authority. With the Lord, there is unrivaled authority. Jacob finds himself tired, and he stops, and he takes a nap on a rock, which is, I guess, what you use back then. He grabs a rock, and he lays it down, and it says in verse 12, he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. There's some things that we notice here. He's dreaming, and he sees a ladder, and on the ladder, there are angels ascending and descending, going up and down on this ladder. So immediately, we come to understand that there is a spiritual realm that we cannot see. And in this moment, God shows Jacob that there is this path between heaven and earth. There is a ladder. And who stands above it? It says that God stood above it in verse 13. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. So we have a picture here of God standing above the affairs of this world. He sees all. There are three omnis we talk about in the church world. God is omnipotent, meaning he's all-powerful. God is omnipresent, which means he is everywhere. This is why like, we don't pray that God would meet us today. We don't, pr- we don't invite God into our gathering. God is here. We are his church. He is here where you are. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you. He is with you everywhere you go. Right now, God is present. God is omniscient. He knows everything. There is nothing that he does not know. He knows everything that you speak. The Bible says he knows the words on your mouth before they ever exit your mouth. He knows everything. He knows what you think. He knows how you feel. He knows how afraid you are right now because your future, you just don't know what it's going to look like. In your financial crisis, in your pregnancy, in your marriage, in your home, in your sin struggles. He knows it all, and he stands above it all. And God will fulfill his redemptive plans. This is a promise we have been given. God will fulfill his plans in Jacob's life. We've seen that no matter what. There's no stopping the redemptive plans of God. And God will fulfill his redemptive plans in the New Testament all the way today so that we know that every person across the world, that there will be someone gathered around the throne from every tribe, nation, tongue across history because God has promised it. And so we walk in God's redemptive plans today. But notice here what we see in this picture. What we see is a picture of the reversal of Babel. If we remind ourselves back to Genesis 11, at the Tower of Babel, man tried to build a structure that would reach up to heaven. They were trying to build a gate to heaven on their own. But God uh, foiled their attempts by confusing their languages and dispersed them across the nations. Remember that, Genesis 11? He, He, at Babel, he just disperses them all because man cannot get to God on their own. Man cannot build their own way to heaven. There is nothing you and I can do to work ourselves to heaven. There's nothing you and I can do to get in God's good graces. We have a lot of people who 
who come here from a Catholic background. And uh, we are so glad that you're a part of our faith family. We have conversations with, with people regularly. I just met a, a young man a few weeks ago who was first time coming here, uh, coming to a church outside of Catholic Mass. And I was like, what'd you think? He goes, whew, man, much different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, we believe that God has made a way for us to come to him, not by our own works, not by how much praying we do or how much giving we do or how many people we're praying to or how many times we confess our sins to someone else. The only way we can get into a relationship with God is by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. God made a way for us to come to him through his son, Jesus. We'll get there. So here, God builds the tower. He builds the ladder. Jacob calls the place where he had this vision, the gate of heaven. And at the end of the dream, people aren't dispersed among the nations as at Babel. Instead, God promises to unite people under one new nation in this dream to Jacob. So instead, God promises to do these things, led by a new king, God's own son. So at Babel, God seeks Uh, Man seeks his own way, but at Bethel, God makes a way. This picture is a reminder that God has come to you. It's a reminder that God is not disengaged with the world. God is very engaged with the world. God is very engaged with his church. That means God is very engaged with your life, Christian. He's very engaged with your marriage. He's very engaged with your children. He's very engaged with your situation. He's very in tune with every feeling you're feeling. So the temptation is to run and do it our own way. But God says, don't do it your own way. Come to me. Rest in me. With me is unrivaled authority, and I know what I'm doing in you. Second thing we see. As we see with the Lord, there is unconditional love. Unconditional love. We remind ourselves of what Jacob's been through here. I mean, he's been through it. He, he if there's someone who deserves to be forsaken by God, it certainly is, it is Jacob. But notice what he says. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. We expect him to say, I can't believe you blasphemed me. I can't believe you did this or you did that. But he says, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. We remind ourselves here that Jacob is on the, on the run. He's going to be fleeing. He's going to be going through the land. He won't be staying here. He goes to Laban, and he spends 20 years somewhere else. And he doesn't know any of that. We know that because we're in the story. And notice the narrator here seems to know, even when Jacob's alone, everything going on in Jacob. This is how we, again, elevate the truth that the Lord wrote the Bible, inspired men to write it. He knows everything going on here. And so while Jacob's going through the land, the Lord promises the land in which you're lying in will be yours. As far as north and south, east and west, this will be yours. And we highlight the importance of unconditional love because God's love is not by merit, but by grace. Here, Jacob's sin is not held against him. Jacob's sin is not held against him. God shows grace to sinners. God's love takes us from having nothing to having everything. Jacob literally goes from being homeless and on the run to a whole new future, a bright new future. In the moment, he is homeless, running, and God says, your future is greater than you ever imagined. You're going to have all the land. You're going to be blessed with offspring. You're going to have it all. All of it belongs to you because of my grace because of my promise. And there's so much here that we as Christians can even preach to ourselves that we must remind ourselves that this world and the affairs of this world are temporary compared to our eternal future with a new heaven and new earth, with a home there, with the inheritance that belongs to Jesus. 
a promised land to come while we sit as aliens and sojourners here. This is why we don't get all worked up on politics. We don't get all worked up on our financial ups and downs. It makes us nervous and it scares us. But at the end of the day, we trust that God loves us, that God knows us, that God is for us, that we can rest in his unconditional love and that we can love him no matter if we have much or we have little. No matter if we are in major health challenges or whether we're the healthiest we've ever been. And all the things that we go through are used by God to form us into the image and likeness of his son. He's sanctifying us, wooing us back to him, keeping us from ourselves. There are times in my life, I don't know if you feel me, if we've ever been like, man, why does this keep going on? Why does this keep happening right now? It seems like every time I start to get comfortable, something happens that make me have to be more dependent on God. Why can't he just let me not be so dependent? Because he knows if I'm dependent on myself, I'm not gonna need him as much. And maybe you're there today where you gotta be reminded that you've got to depend on the Lord, trust in him. Number three, with the Lord there is unbelievable blessing, unbelievable blessing. And there's four really things here that I believe are highlighted, and I just wanna highlight them quickly. You see the blessing of God's presence with his people? The blessing of God's presence is so clear. I will be with you no matter what. Behold, I am with you, will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. The I wills of God are so strong, and I don't know, I've not, I've not had to do this yet, but I'm sure one day I will, where I will send one of my kids off to college or, or somewhere, <laughs> hopefully. Plan is to send them off. But as a dad, like, I, I want my promises to count. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, no matter what issues you face, I will be right here. I will be right here. You can hear that in God's, in God's voice here to Jacob. I will do these things for you. I will be with you. No matter what, the presence of God is with you. Number two, the blessing of God's provision. I will take care of you. Notice what Jacob does when he wakes up. Jacob wakes up and he's like, he's like, how awesome is this place? He's like, God just spoke to me. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured out oil on top of it. Verse 19, he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, and if God will keep me in this way that I go, and if God will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear. Notice that Jacob's provision is from the Lord. God's with me. He will clothe me. He will feed me. How much do you have to like experience the Lord to go, all right, I don't have to fight for myself. I don't have to like strive for it and plot for it and scheme for it. I can trust that God will provide for me here. You see the blessing of God's provision for his people. So much so that Jacob goes, all right, the Lord's going to feed me. I don't have to worry about that. He's going to clothe me. Whew. I'm not going to be anxious about that. I can just trust God. Number three, you see the blessing of God's protection. Blessing of God's protection. Verse 21, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. How can Jacob know that? Esau's against him. Esau's gonna kill him if he returns, but he has the promise of God's protection. God's promised me I'm gonna have it. God's promised he's with me. He's gonna clothe me. He's gonna provide for me. So therefore I can go back there knowing that I'm gonna return in peace because God's presence is with me. He's providing for me and he is protecting me. So much we learn here. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And all of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Here's the fourth one. 
The blessing of God's preeminence. Preeminence. I'll put it right there on the screen so you can learn how to spell it there. Preeminence. This is the first time proportionate giving is seen in the Old Testament. It's not yet commanded, but notice what it, or why it's done. It's done as a response of who the Lord is. Jacob is saying, the Lord will be first. All I have comes from him, and as an act of worship, I will give back because he will be preeminent in my life. I won't depend on what I can bring in. I won't just be tempted to live on all that I get. The tenth of everything I receive, I'm going to give back as an act of worship to God. Out of the overflow of his heart, out of just a, a sheer desire to show God that he gets first, that he is the provider, he willingly, in worship, gives back to God. Simple question, is he preeminent in your life? Not, not giving-wise, but just in general. Are you living in a place where the Lord is preeminent in all that you do, in, in your home, in your life, in your time, in your money, in your success? Are you worshiping God because how awesome is he? How awesome is he to save a couple over lunch because they stumbled into a church, went to a growth track, had lunch with a pastor, and realized in God's mercy they weren't saved, and they trusted Jesus. Have you experienced conversion in your own life today? When someone goes from death to life, you know what happens? The angels in heaven rejoice over just one. Has that grown numb in your heart? baptized a couple whose marriage is forever changed, whose family and whatever children the Lord gives them is forever changed because of the gospel. Is the Lord preeminent in your life? Genesis 28 teaches as much about God's presence with his people and his redemptive plans. It also introduces us to Jesus Christ as the one who would come. How in John 1, 51, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is the latter in this story. He is the one who connects earth and heaven. This is why God can overlook sin, because he sees with Jesus in mind. He knows what he's doing for his people. This is why he can testify about Jesus, as we'll get into Exodus eventually one day, where, where we'll see a picture of Jesus all throughout the Old Testament. Because Jesus is coming. Because of Jesus, we know that he's the one who bridges the spiritual gap between God and man that was caused by the brokenness of sin. See, Jesus comes as the perfect sacrifice. He comes as the spotless Lamb of God. He dies a sacrificial death on the cross for the sin of man, and he rises victoriously, and he saves all those who would come to him by faith, which leads us to something else Jesus said that's also seen in the story. Jesus says in John 10, 3, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. See, not only did Jesus say he's the ladder, but he also said he's the gate. He's the door to heaven. He's the one who bridges the gap that exists between your sinful heart and God's holiness. He's the one righteous person who made it possible. So listen, if you want to know how you can find forgiveness for all your sin, Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You can have hope and restoration in life today by trusting in Jesus. It's found only in him. To those who know Christ, we can be reminded today that you're covered by grace. You're not, you're not forsaken, you're forgiven. And that's good news. So stop drumming it all back up. Stop listening to the, the devil. Stop listening and being tempted to think that you're something that you're not. You're forgiven. Get him out of your head. Fully forgiven. 
You're set free. Quit giving into it. Confess it. Live in the freedom that Christ has bought for you on the cross. Stand strong, knowing I'm not forsaken. I am forgiven, and my future is bright. God has a plan for me. So because of Christ, number one, we can trust in God's provision. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what you're going to, but what I do know is God stands above the world and he sees it all and you can trust on him always. You can trust that he will provide for you. Luke 12 says, but if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field and today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Don't seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried for all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Second Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. God has called you. He knows you. He will take care of you. So how are you doubting God's provision in your life? Will he not care for you? Does he not love you? Number two, we can find comfort in God's protection. You are going through some challenging things right now. Some of you are about to face some of the most challenging seasons of your life. That's what happens in Jacob's life. Jacob will go here from here and land in Laban where he will be deceived And he will live in the fruit of some of his consequences. And it will be really hard for him. He'll spend seven years and seven more years. And he'll go through a 20-year spell before God fulfills his promise. I don't know how long you're in it right now. But what I do know is God knows and God loves you. God cares for you. And God will always fulfill his promises even when you feel like you might be alone. But you can find God comfort knowing that God will protect you. Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will always provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And then to us again, Hear the words of Jesus in Matthew 28, spoken to his disciples and spoken to those of us who have the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the ends of the earth. There again, I am with you. I am with you. I will do these things through you. So what are you not trusting God to bring you through? What are you not, where are you tempted to not trust God in life? To not take care of you, not bring you through? Does he not know what his plans are for you? Does he not know how he's forming you into the likeness of his son? And number three, we can give God preeminence. We can give God preeminence. In all of our life, Jacob here vows to live for God no matter what, he's, I'm, I'm yours, you're mine, you're with me, I'm with you. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, trust the Lord with all your heart, do not lean on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Is your life a living testimony of God's work in you? seeking to live for his glory in every conversation and every thought, taking every thought captive, living in honesty, a life of integrity, not marked by moral corruption or immorality, but marked by the presence of the Holy Spirit, the convicting presence of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean you're perfect. It means that when you do sin, you're quick to repent of it because you can't be perfect. There's There's no moral perfection here. There is one man, one mediator between heaven and earth, the God-man, Jesus Christ. So where does God not reign in your life? Does he have 
priority in your heart? Does he have priority in your home, in your marriage, in your finances, in your church commitment? Is he, does he have priority? Like Jacob, God wants to meet you right where you are. He will meet you with abundant grace and mercy. You can come to him with all of your mess, whether you're a believer or a non-believer. Temptation, when we believers sin, is to run and hide from him. But the evidence of our salvation runs to him and says, Lord, I don't want that. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I, I confess. Lord, that was wrong. Lord, I don't want that anymore. Lord, help me. He will take you as you are. See, Jesus is a ladder to God. He's the gate to eternal life. He has made a way. He's the ransom for our life. He purchased me by his death. And those of us in Christ are not forsaken, but forgiven. Even Jesus, Jesus himself was the one who was forsaken for us. So we wouldn't be forsaken. This is why he cries out, my God, my God, while on the cross dying for your sin, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken so that you and I would not be forsaken. And the Christian's triumph, our theme, as the hymn says, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. All our sin nailed to the cross, and truly we bear it no more. Have you forgot that today, that you bear your sin no more? You are fully forgiven, not forsaken. Maybe you walked in here feeling beat up and convicted and disappointed in yourself. Well, the good news is this. If you believe the gospel, then the gathering of the church is the opportunity every week to have our heads lifted back to the cross, to reset our eyes on the kingdom of heaven where Jesus is seated and to remind ourselves of whose we are who's our king, what we're called to, and who we're to be about, and remind ourselves this world tells us lies, but Jesus holds our future. So even in this moment, the Lord is with you wherever you go. Even in your trial, the Lord is with you wherever you go. Even in your sin, the Lord is with you wherever you go. And even in sickness, the Lord is with you wherever you go. He loves his people and he's faithful He's steadfastly committed to you. He's committed to you and your marriage that you might feel is rocky. He can fix it. He can redeem it. He's committed to your child who professed faith one day when they were younger, but for some reason, Lord, they're doing their own thing. He can, he can call them back. He's committed to you. Are you committed to him? Are you, have you vowed to know him? Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. You've never given your life to Christ. Well, today is the day. Don't leave here without confessing Jesus as Lord. You come to him in repentance. I turn from my sin, I turn from my life, and I trust in Jesus. You come to him in faith. You come to him with hope. Have you given your life to Christ today? If not today, let's do it.